Hello, welcome to the 44th edition of Airhacks TV with lots of questions. So here we go. So let's start with uh, announcement. And this uh, is not uh, insignificant. So uh, we were a little bit uh, tight with the uh, room size here. And I managed to get the largest room on the airport, also the nicest room at the airport for the day second, second to fourth. So uh, there will be almost no limits. Also, I will probably close uh, the registration 25 seats so there's about i don't know three more seats available and it's really tight is the, the the first day there are already 21 registrations okay so this is um uh the, the the workshops in december and the next year so we are after the web edition of airhacks and what i what i did is that there will be a single page application without frameworks is a uh, very similar to the web standards igniter with uh, a little bit more uh, app focus like uh, offline capability service workers and navigation and routing and uh, the second day is, is built on top of the first one and i will talk a little bit about uh, web components, web component standard, standards, how to build apps with web components, and of course mention Polymer 3.0 and some other uh, uh, web components frameworks. So uh, this happens in March, and hence uh, React 16 frameworks is MIT licensed, so there are no more, uh, no more licensing issues. I also plan to deliver a um, React framework, but it will be later, so I think April or May. Okay, so this was this news. Something very new. Um, there is a podcast, and um, uh, I started the first episode. Um, this is uh, October 15th, right uh, uh, after Java 1. So it was a monologue. I'm just talking about Java 1. But the second uh, episode with, uh, was with Sebastian Daschner. It is a um, Airhex alumni. So he attended um, a few years ago Airhex. And now uh, he's also uh, speaks at conferences, is Java champion, and uh, and we are chat about uh, the state of Java. E, and there are more episodes to come. If you like, register so you can go to iTunes and get notified about new ep episodes, or there's um, direct RSS feed. So this is um, this, and now start with the very first question. And uh, the very first question is. Um, that during the talk, Java heavyweight or lightweight, this is a talk at Java 1. And um, I, I, I deliver the talk because I get uh, frequently the question, you know, um, what about the size of application servers? Are, are they not too big? Why I'm using them and they are too slow? And, and this, uh, this uh, talk only focuses on that. And by the way, I'm delivering similar talk, um, so with a little bit more content and, 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 and switched, of course, uh, uh, switched the contest a little bit. Tomorrow at the WJAX conference in Munich. So if you are in Munich, um, just uh, I think it's around 5 p.m. So, but uh, he asks, uh, I didn't mention um, Spring. Uh, why that? So why I didn't compare Spring to Java E? And the answer is uh, um, fairly simple. Um, so most of, as all of my projects are Java E. I never started a Greenfield Spring project. So uh, I, I would have to prepare something uh, for the conference, for the talk. And um, also what I did in the talk is I compared application servers with Hello World Java SE, so with nothing. So this is the worst possible case. Uh, fully loaded or full-blown uh, Java E full stack application servers uh, WebSphere, Glassfish, and uh, I also uh, used the uh, Whitefly Swarm, and I compared them with uh, server sockets with one thread, a Java SE application, so there was nothing. If I would use Spring, I think that the, the, the footprint of Spring would be similar to uh, Java E um, application servers, and there were lots of discussion, you know, um, whether I used the right configuration or not, and, and there was like, this was not the point. The point was, you know, um, how much... Uh, RAM or footprint or download size, we can save by not using the application servers and, and build something completely, I would say, lightweight and custom. Therefore, uh, Spring was not uh, the option in the talk. But um, if you like, prepare something, I will point to it. So now, uh, Hugo works. Um, ask me. I'm watching Web Standards Igniter. So Web, Web Standards Igniter is an online workshop which just focuses on you know the UI like how to call it if if uh someone would uh, if a java e developer would develop or no applications uh uis how he would approach she or she or he of course would approach the situation and what i did is 
I um, yeah, I just in this workshop I just focus on standards uh, without any framework. So I'm just building everything from scratch and show you how it works. So similar to what I always do with Java, e. and uh, so this is the the course is mentioned here. And the question is um, why uh, how I would implement uh, the bar in HTML5. So first, so very simple bar. It would be a diff with uh, background. So it's very and uh, with. Uh, Flex layout, you are almost there, so uh, it will, would be very, very easy to implement. Uh, but the, S, the, que the actual question is with server send events, web sockets, or long polling. So in the past, I always use long polling, and um, because it always worked, um, except you know the, 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 should, the, the, the timeout should be short, not that long. So what long polling is is the server blocks connections, and if uh, um, sorry, the um, the browser initiates the con uh, connection, the browser blocks the connection, and if there is something to push to the browser, the server pu pushes uses the block connection and then closes the connection, and in the next second or so, the browser reopens the connection. This is the full cycle. So uh, what about the server? Is this just a simple server socket or, or web so socket? It is a, a JAXRS, asynchronous JAXRS, uh, uh, how is it called, not server, a resource. So it was servlet in the early Java 6 and Java 5 days. So I use servlets for that. And of course, web socket is just one annotation server endpoint. So um, in, in any case, in the case of JAXRS, there is just one annotation uh, suspended and uh, async context, async response, what you get. And in the case of WebSockets, you have one class with one annotation, server endpoint, and all other annotations are very similar to the corresponding JavaScript methods. Um, and he uses Socket.io or Atmosphere, exactly. Socket.io, I would say, is a little bit more popular than Atmosphere. So Atmosphere comes from, from Java, so it's uh, actually from Grizzly. It's a Java e solution, and Socket IO is used by all the UI front end uh, devs. And the question about fallback. So what I did uh, recently, I implemented a chat which used WebSockets to push the information. The point was, in, um, the WebSockets were just uh, like notification. Was just a notification mechanism uh, to notify the client that something changed, and the client was uh, meant to fetch the changes using using JAXRS. So in this particular case, uh, if WebSockets wouldn't be supported, the uh, the user would have to, to, to push the refresh button manually. So this was uh, my way of dealing with the situation, and I didn't have to use any additional framework. So of course, Socket.io does it more, um, uh, does it more um, transparently. The question is now, how Often it happens nowadays that the uh, that uh, web sockets are actually blocked. So it happens less and less, and this is a firewall issue. So this is what you will have to evaluate first to know how high is the probability that the web sockets gets blocked. So this is an interesting one. So Simon Passarelli asked me, do you have any idea why JAXP has been deprecated with Java 9? And um, so um, indeed it is, and there is actually a post, so I will Copy it to the to the chat, and so let's do this. <laughs> Someone says, Adam, we wish to see you at DevOps Belgium. So, but you see me right now, and not only you and everyone else. So, I had no time this time to, for for DevOps uh, crazy times. But thank you, and um, next time. So, but um, um, yeah. So this is uh, the. Um, where was it? Here. Module shared with Java E not resolved by default. And uh, what it means is Jack's P is also a part of Java E and Oracle decides to, uh, to you know, to, to, to make this the standard and not uh, the Java SE. So in, in, in future, you will have to use uh, additional module with Java SE to have Jack's P. Jack's P itself is not deprecated actually. In fact, if I, we go to JCP and I think this is 222. Uh, 2.20? No. 2.2.2? Two, two, two. Yes, uh, Java architecture for XML binding, and the recent is 2.3 version. And as you can see, uh, it is uh, quite in development. So we had um, some reviews, and the maintenance review ballot was in 18th of April. So it happens a lot there. So it's not like it's not further developed. It's more like um, it is it's going to be removed from Java SE 
and and not being dub, uh, supported double in Java SE and Java EE. This is at least uh, my interpretation of this. Um, yeah, so this is, um, if you have any other information, just uh, write, write a comment. So done that, uh, next one. This is actually also interesting one. So uh, Hugo again, so ask me, in my opinion, what is more faster in HTML, in a text? So now switch the <laughs> switch com com complete uh, uh, um, context switch. So this refers to HTML5 and actually not HTML5, just uh, DOM API, browser DOM API. So what is more faster using an inner HTML and inner text? So actually inner text is going to be faster because there is nothing to parse and inner HTML, what you can do, you can pass um, HTML tags and the browser will have to parse them. Then document create element, document clean uh, clone node. And what you forgot to ask is document dot uh, create fragment, which is really interesting. So with a fragment, you can create prepare uh, your uh, elements and then flush them at once to the browser, which is supposed to be a little bit more faster. So by the way, uh, in uh, at the very end of the web standards in Igniter workshop, I created a, a table with 10,000 rows and uh, I forgot how many, I, I suppose 10 to 100 columns, I, I don't know how many. And um, the whole table was rendered without any optimizations in about uh, two seconds. So um, the question is now, what we are talking about? What we are building? If you are building a game, this is an issue. If you are building an enterprise app, uh, and don't bother with that. Uh, just you know, implement a simple, uh, just uh, just keep your code simple and forgot any micro optimizations. But still. So and this is a nice article I read it um, from Medium about how to write your own virtual DOM. And uh, which is also interesting, so I would like to open the article. And, um, or use a vendor library. So what, what happened is, it turns out that you could actually not, not, uh, not use any virtual DOM or shadow DOM and just focus on ES6 templates. And this is the fastest methods. And this is what Polymer 3 is going to do. They, will, uh, they are experimenting with JavaScript-based uh, algorithm uh, to track changes and this is called lit HTML I think let's wait a second lit HTML yes this is the um, HTML template literals for um, for for polymer uh, in JavaScript and they, they make they made some uh, performance consideration and happens to be the fastest uh, fastest uh, solution um, the problem with virtual DOM is of course you need more memory so you you will have to you know to keep the elements twice once in the browser and once in your shadow dom in one point of time to synchronize them so why this solution uh, why i'm talking a lot about virtual dom because um, every java e developer uh, sh um, sh should should uh, should uh, understand immediately you know what virtual dom is if you if you look at jpa and entity manager so the entity manager inside is something like a virtual dom this is called transaction so um, if it creates a changes, and actually in the article, they have similar problem, you know, how to detect changes of non no more existing entities or DOM elements. And uh, what the, um, what, uh, the, uh, the entity manager does, it calls that unit of work internally. So um, you are, you are this batching the changes. So all deleted entities and all updated entities and uh, all created entities. And at the end of the transaction, this is what is flushed to the, uh, to the DOM. This is what Angular does with zones. So at the end of the rendering process, everything is synchronized. And this is what React also does with uh, the virtual DOM. But Polymer will do something different with uh, templating without virtual DOM. And um, they, they claim to be as, as fast as virtual DOM. So what, what does the message is here, forgot about optimizations and write simple code. <laughs> okay, I hope it's clear. So now, Victor asked me, uh, what are the uh, reference implementation servers or similar for Eclipse micro profile? Um, so Eclipse micro profile, I think this is E4J. So I know for E4J, there will be uh, several reference implementations for one API. So it's not like D1 implementation rather than multiple. And uh, the micro profile is impl implemented, should be implemented by Tommy Swarm. Uh, and of course, Payara micro. And to my knowledge, there is no reference implementations 
there are multiple reference implementations. And uh, this was actually discussed in the E4J mailing list. So if you're interested in it, look at that. So what will be the impact of the new release scheme for Java of Java SE? So this is like we get the next release, uh, release is going to be 18.3, which means 2018 and March uh, for the E4J or Spring. So um, I think what will happen the uh, features of Java uh, Java 9 could uh, land uh, earlier in the spec because E4J will move faster than Java E did because the uh, process is more open, I hope, right? And uh, and um, and Spring is even faster because Spring, that there is actually no specification to follow. They can do whatever they like. So, um, of course, uh, they, they have to uh, to uh, to listen to the community, but they, they, they could move even faster. I think what will happen is all the new features will be uh, adopted by the micro profile first, which is going to be like an incubator for all new features. And then if the feature major, they will land in E4J. Um, yeah, and Spring will be probably as fast as micro profile. So this is probably what will happen. So, and what... Um, the the next feature uh, which we we have to to watch closer is the uh, the um, I actually forgot that you can skip the um, the uh, types for uh, declarations of variables in using just var like the uh, ES5 was in JavaScript. Okay, der Ratzmann. So first, uh, nice to see you. So this is a very short story. So. Uh, Monsieur de Ratzmann asked me at Java One whether I would like to drink something something after the session via Twitter, and my answer was, um, "We are at Java One and not Oktoberfest, so I'm glad not to drink anything. I will just like focus on Java." And then I drank a, uh, drank a co coffee after the Java One in a, a coffee near Moscone, and I met the, the uh, Monsieur de Ratzmann, and he told me. You wrote on Twitter that uh, you are not for drinking here and drinking some coffee. So we had that coffee together and a nice chat. So this was the uh, small world story. So um, whether I have experience with EGB timer synchronization via Hazelcast, not with Hazelcast, rather than with database. So um, if you use the database, there's actually not, nothing to do. What they will do is they will just store the values in a, in a central table. So if you have... In a Docker network, this is not issue at all because if uh, all the Hazelcast clients are in the same Docker network, um, uh, Hazelcast just works. This is actually what what happens on my blog. All these stats are stored in several Hazelcast instances running in Docker in the same network, and uh, the synchronization just works. So I'm confident it will work. The problem, of course, is you know what do you expect because if you if the timer will have to synchronize, what it means if the timer fires in one node, what um, what you would actually expect that the node locks until the changes are replicated everywhere else, and then the locks is freed, which may 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 lead to deadlocks, and if you would replicate asynchronously, the uh, timer could fire multiple times anyway. So uh, what can happen then, of course, if you, let's say, the t this is an uh, unusual setup, but the timer could fire every two milliseconds, let's say, or let's say every second, and the replication takes one and a half second, then uh, it, it, it just wouldn't work. So you get uh, multiple timer initializations um, in the same uh, network. So this is the problem. Is there an easy way to test it? So is a way to test it. You will need a central database uh, with a table with the uh, name of the node, and I will count something up and see whether it works. And and then the test will just go to the database and see you know whether there was just one node counting or multiple nodes. This is how I would test. So in order to test it, you will need a central central place, a singleton, and the best singleton in distributed setup is a database. I hope I answered your question. Uh, so. Bail Lovic. In order to generate reports, I use several SQL and processing in my Java code. One solution is to prepare the data in views, and I use the report to generate the data from it. So, uh, is the use of views a good thing in this case? Absolutely. So, a uh, database views. I hope this is what you mean. So, uh, create view from whatever from select. So, and um, 
And this um, is actually the best case because uh, the data is already prepared in the database and you get a very, very nice, let's call it API, which is accessible via JPA. So you can map a JPA entity to a view and fetch very conveniently the report data or use JDBC for that. And by the way, uh, my anhydrator framework uh, it's, would be also perfect for that. So what, what it could do is uh, just um, you know use JDBC to fetch the report data and transform it in, in real time to JSON or, or, or an another format, so CSV, JSON. And uh, the problem is, of course, the question you have to ask is how often you have to adjust the reports. If this is a one-shot report, so view are perfect, views are perfect, but if this is a report which changes frequently because you get new requirements from the business department, then in my eyes it would be a lot better to keep you know, the, the report definition outside the database. Um, and what, uh, what I would even think about is to use JSPs for the Java server pages, so why not? So there's actually an, an, an old and an extremely fast solution, you know, to, uh, to 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 have scriptable data access. Of course, uh, what you shouldn't do use too much scriptlets in the JSP view. But what you could do is you could have like a data access layer, which could be CDI beans, which go which are named at named, and then you can inject them into a JSP. So if you like uh, injection uh, CDI injection to JSP would be a nice three minute screencast. So if you're interested in it, just ping me and I will record that. So the implementation that I want to do is with JPA, okay? Uh, but according to my knowledge, it's necessary to use native query. Uh, not necessary. You can use, if you have to use native queries, use, na use named named native queries. This is important. Native queries are a little bit dangerous from security consideration. What you could, of course, use named queries. Why not? So you can just use named queries, which get translated to native queries. And in your case, uh, consider map the JPA to a DB view. So it works absolutely. We did it in projects. Okay, so uh, Redis database, database. I think, uh, yeah, Redis IO. So this is the uh, Redis uh, database. This is in memory data structure, use the database. And the question is now related to Redis. I need to start a new demo project which should use Redis in combination with JaxRes. So Vasilayo, the question I have to you is, what does it mean? Why you should use Redis? So who tells you that? So why is it necessary to use Redis in combination with JaxRes? The application should load some basic data from database, okay? Make some computation based on REST input param. Uh, I mean, REST input param is, means uh, there is uh, probably a post or put method and there are some pass params and uh, you will parse the params and do something with it and save the result in Redis for later requests. Later requests probably means, you know, in later transactions and then in memory database could break. So um, I, I think the Redis will run not in process rather than a central place. Can you help me to understand what should be the correct architecture of such application? And is it valuable to have this combination? I mean, first, I have no idea what you would like to build. So it is unusual to use Redis just without any additional, you know, Requirement so Redis is just uh, in in so in memory fast in memory database. What I would think as a Java developer first is H2 or Java DB, for instance, is um, in memory. It is uh, extremely fast, and um, and regardless which solution you are using, what uh, what you should be a little bit careful is there is some costs associated serializing and deserializing Java objects from a uh, external database to memory back and forth. So my first idea would be to use concurrent hash map um, as a very simple cache, and then see uh, whether it actually works. So you can use a singleton, just go for it. So, and 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 Redis, I mean, I have, <laughs> question is no. For, for instance, I use in one project Elasticsearch, and wh why I use it? Because I really wanted to have a full text search and they had already JSON in place, and it was a natural choice. So it was easy to explain what to choose. So um, if you have uh, would like to have just no JSON, you could even go with Postgres. So it's like you know, very fast database, very easy to install, and uh, with JSON and and even uh, NoSQL support. 
So, um, yeah, it is a viable solution. So what would be the correct architecture? It would be a thin war, no dependencies. Um, there would be a BCE boundary control entity. It means uh, I would think about the concepts. The concept would become the component, a top level package. Within the package, there will be boundary and the boundary you get a resource like, for instance, computations resource. This would be your entry point. Then you get a computation service and into the service you can inject a remote reference to Redis, Elasticsearch or uh, whatever database you have. And um, Redis is not um, supported right away. So what you will have to do is to integrate that. And if you like to integrate that, how to do this? Yeah, you would have a class. It could be a singleton or not. And this class will produce the uh, Redis uh, binding, which can be injectable everywhere. So the correct architecture in your case, a proof of concept, should be no more than three classes. By the way, um, my recent project two weeks ago was um, was a really fun. So um, I got it will uh, about forty classes proof of concept, and I, and I had to review the architecture. And the review, I spent, I think, I don't know, two days just describing in, in 30 PowerPoint slides, you know, what not to do. And my client told me, okay, could you just change that? So what I did is, I, I think, removed everything. And what, what, what was left was like, I think, four to five classes in total. It was the full Java E applications without any dependencies. And all there were multiple frameworks involved and, and mappers and everything was gone. So this, is, this was my kind of project. So in your case, there should be not more than three to five classes if this is a Java E app. Okay, any questions here? No questions here. Also no, nothing here. Except requests to be in DevOps Belgium is impossible to be in Belgium and in Munich or at Airhex at the same time. So, done. And this is cool. I have been working on a port of Java e roller block code to Java E. This is really fun because uh, archive adambin.com, I think. Yes. What this is, this is um, archive of all my blog posts going back to 2006 <laughs> with the second post while blogging and over eclipsed. <laughs> So let's see, over eclipsed. Uh, ah, Eclipse Callisto. So it's about Eclipse. Yeah, so interesting. So, um, and what this is, I just, um, I was asked whether there's, you know, like a summary of all blog posts I wrote, which this is exactly that. And how it works is I using SPG. This is the uh, static page generator from, look at GitHub for us, SPG and Adam Bean. And it di directly connects to a roller database to us. Uh, this is also the block engine I'm using and it generates that. And I thought about replacing the original um, uh, Apache roller with my own implementation. And it seems like Relay does something similar. This is why, why it's really interesting. So, and he asked me about, um, he working on a part and is it beyond scope of the show to do a critique? So, um, yeah, yes, but uh, this is actually as, as, I mean, a smaller project, so we can absolutely do that. So what I did is I just opened the, downloaded the sources and opened the project. And the cool story is now I can talk about the sources. Usually I cannot because all the source I see is from my clients with lots of NDAs. And the first time I get something, you know, open source and someone asked me to publicly criticize the code, which is great for me. So first I open that. So what I would in, do in my reviews, I would just open that and then see, okay, this, this is not a Java E project. This is a uh, lots of dependencies. And I would ask first, you know, why you have so many dependencies? And the answer would be probably because uh, this is a port. And so what I would expect over time to remove more and more dependencies from, from there. And then you should end up just having Java 7. This would be, this would be my uh, my requirement to our Java port. And then what I found first, I just would very briefly open the very first package. And what I found is this. And uh, an interface with uh, abstract manager. And uh, it does not implement the interface. But if you look at that, I will question the added value of that. So actually in commercial project, I will fully delete it. Because it's an open source project, I could say, okay, this is an experimentation, which is absolutely fine. But in uh, in commercial code reviews, this will be a defect because there is no added value over the entity manager. So first, I would delete both and uh, also this. 
and um, so so let's keep this so uh, I think in the later if you Henry if you're still interested I could criticize you further the next package in the next episode and uh, the next if you would like to be a successful open source project you should also change you know the packaging name I wouldn't use your name here because you know the other contributors who would say okay this is uh, uh, I, I don't know uh, we would have to have something neutral. So then you could look at my project, say, "Hey, why are you using Comiahex?" And the answer is the, is the, a little bit uh, different. So I'm using Comiahex because some of my projects are in Sonar Type Central. In one requirement is to be open source, and you have to own the URL. And the only non-personal URL I own is com.airhex, and everything is Comiahex, which is public. So this is why I'm using, going this way. And I'm not that interested in contribution, so I'm not, you know, the perfect open source guy. I'm more, you know, I do something, if I have I, I push it to GitHub and, 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 and see what happens. But it's not like I try to build, build you know, uh, a new business on open source software. So whether someone contributes or not, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. And, and, and um, honestly, I wouldn't have time, you know, to support projects, uh, I don't know, with one day a week to create new features. So this, this wouldn't work. But he has uh, some specific questions. And the questions are, works only for Whitefly Hibernate. And he added some stuff. The classes in questions are the user's entity. So let's just open the user's entities. And I couldn't identify the problem. So if you look at the user's entity so first he says this entity does not work or, or on windows so no entity doesn't work on windows he had to rename it to entities um this cannot be true um i i i had the, uh, the windows before and the entity package name always worked what i guess what he did is he generated the um the entities from a database and then also generated properly the boundary from a database uh from from uh from um uh, with NetBeans, but uh, the uh, entities really look like generated classes. So what you, you should be careful, I would look at this, at the name queries, and really think about how many queries do you really need, because that many queries will cause uh, slowdown of your deployment. Having said that, I couldn't identify the problem. So again, I couldn't, uh, I didn't uh, deploy this to a glassfish because of time. But there is no dependencies on, on Hibernate. There are, there are no Hibernate-specific features in the classes. So it actually could work. What I would do first is to remove everything you don't need. And then, um, and then uh, like this, this, this looks actually reasonable and also user role. So I couldn't identify any problems which are you know, Hibernate specific, and therefore they don't work, run or I couldn't identify any Hibernate specific features. Okay, also something like the user manager here. Uh, so at a new user, this for instance, okay, this, this, this works. So we have the entity manager, but you know, the, the whole inheritance, I will remove that. So I uh, thought about create a port with different focus. It seems like you try to provide a multi-tenant solution to a blogger. I think I wouldn't do this anymore. Um, so uh, this is what's called Planet in Blogger. What I would do is like you know, know uh, a blog engine for a single user. And in the microservice world, you know who cares about multi-tenancy? So if you have five tenants, you have five microservices. This was the best possible isolation. So if you do this, you could remove you know all the users and security altogether, and you end up having you know. A block engine just for one block instance. If someone would like to you know have more blocks, then will instantiate more engines, which is uh, a far easier to manage, monitor, and we all know that the uh, Java E is lightweight enough, so there should be no no issues. If you are still interested, clean up the code and drop me a mail, and we have the Renovi review part two in the forty fifth episode, almost on Christmas. It will be in the beginning of of December. Okay, so now something happened in the chat. So what's wrong here? So I don't get any, the view is loading, okay. So Henry says, uh, thanks for reviewing the project. So hopefully you are still happy. So um, I, I was a little bit too critical, but uh, you know, you asked me for that and this was the first uh, first impression. So again, if you like, if you, if you like, clean up the code, 
throw away all the code and uh, throw away Archelian, whatever you have is not needed. So keep it really simple, extremely simple, make it work. Then you, if you would like to make it grow, so um, many developers from outside will help you if the code is simple. If it's too complicated, you know, uh, mm. it is no more Java. <laughs> okay, um, thank you. And I will keep, uh, uh, if you like, reviewing in the next episodes with all the attendees. So we will have, I know, multiple, I don't know, at the end of the day, could be, you know, over a thousand reviewers which look on your project. Similar thing. So it's like the Omega09 Ask Me about design question with a checked in project. So, um, also interesting. Genau, a lot from Roller. This is what I thought. So, um, Henry, what I would do is, I would, um, you know, this is what I actually did in my project. I would just create a block with Roller, one single block, then export the tables and create from this crucial tables, the entities, there will be the, you know, the crucial entities, and then, drop everything else so this is what i will do and i know that the roller uh, code is not that easy to understand because the night hacks book it was uh, just just created because of that so i wanted actually to enhance blogger the the roller software with uh, statistics and it didn't work for me because it was old spring version with old hibernate and whatever i did was not compatible so um i just uh, created a project x-ray and all the statistics statistics are computed outside. So this was actually the the idea there. So I would just not even look at the at the source and just uh, create everything from scratch. I think this would be you will move faster with that, and you could keep in the first iterations the tables compatible. That's an idea. Cool. Thank you. Now, injection test. So similar story. Someone asked me about. And I think we answered a similar question the last time, but my answer was not good enough. So we get the second answer. And this is computation processor. So uh, now let's start with the resource. So I'm um, just walk through the code and then look at the question. So it looks like we have the resource, which of course in real world do will be better name like computations uh, resource. And there's a response is computation for me with long ID and uh, some path. And what happens here, the service we get an entity and the service uh, goes to the um, entity manager with which we could remove the private here and uh, then the uh, entity we got the entity which is a persistent oh which is a persistent entity by the way i look at the code oh uh not this here and the first thing I did, of course, I look at the dependencies. And this is a beautiful Java 7 project, you know, single dependency, and everyone knows what happens. So the uh, my entity is the persistence entity. And so I get the entity here. And then we have a container. So and this is where the problem starts. So stateful request scope cannot be stateful, ses stateful session scope would work, but this does not make any sense. Request scope means it is for the request and stateful means it um, and uh, the uh, it lives longer than a request and to make this work this class should be uh, serializable which causes even more trouble so stateful should be removed with request scoped alone this is actually this what you would get anyway so and uh, let's go to the code further so and then you would like to compute with the uh, computation processor so um, and the and the processor what it does is it gets the container I think to get the access to the entity, and now you do something here, uh, compute some steps and change the age of the entity. So, so each steps can change the state of the entity. And then you are done. And then the entity is saved. So um, I think the problem is a way easier to solve without any magic. So what you could do is, so what my understanding is you are in the lucky situation that you have the ID for the entity. So you can fetch the entity. So what happens if, if this is a stateless, just put the stateless here. So what you get is this is transaction begin and this is transaction end. So the entity, you get a copy from the entity from the entity manager, something like a virtual DOM. So your personal copy of the state. Then you can, the uh, compute, you can pass the ID to the compute processor here and the computation processor could fetch the entity and because it's in the same transaction, it gets the same reference to exactly same entity. And then you can do whatever you like 
And the cool story is you don't even have to save the entity because the entity is already an, an so-called so managed or attached entity and then you are done. So actually you can remove everything. You only will have the computation process so with the ID or you can pass the entity or the ID and does not matter. And at the end of the computation, and at the end of the computation, um, all the changes will be automatically stored in the database. Now you're asking me about async. In, in your um, solution will also work in an async way. Why? What you could even do, you can send the ID as a uh, event, CDI event, and then um, asynchronously, and then someone wakes up, processes the entity, and stores in the database, and you are set. And the way back could be using WebSockets, for instance. So you can push the changes back with WebSockets. So um, this would be the more extreme case. What you could also do, you could use here, uh, you could just do this and put here. Um, suspended. Suspended async response. And response. So, and what you could do then is, of course, response dot um, resume. So you can start an asynchronous process, and with the resume, you can push changes back to the browser. So this is what you could also do. If the computation takes longer, the browser will block, but the server, but the uh, but the server would not consume any threats or any HTTP threats for that. I hope it's clear. If not, change the code and ask again. So you have four, four weeks to do this. Cool. So let's see what happens here. So Twitter is quiet. There is... Ah, you um, ask me, uh, Brett Tucker, ask me whether I would like to, to publish um, my podcast, this is Airhacks FM, uh, to Google Play? Of course, if it's possible, I will do this. So I will check it out, so I will try to do this. Uh, no issue with that. So um, everything I did belongs to me. Actually, the, the feed is also generated with SPG, and so I have complete comp control over everything. So um, I will try to do this. So thank you, Brett. And uh, Brett, a few, a few years ago, he was at Airport Munich Workshops Christmas edition, so uh, now it's time to come back. Okay, so um, we did this. The next one. Do you still recommend boundary control pattern for Jaxer's application? Not only that, so actually at Java 1, there are a surprising amount of attendees who came to me and, and told me that the BCE works really well in conjunction with Java E. And um, so I can tell you, not only I consider it's a, it's a good solution, um, it's uh, uh, the other developers also like it. What is the best practice to store conversational state in JAX or a stateless session beans application, which is scalable? So first, what means scalable? So what is your delimitation? The limitation are usually memory or threads, something like this. So um, if you would use stateful session beans or something session scoped, the question is how many instances you can you can you can keep in memory until it breaks. The next problem you will get is if you have load balances, it is they they have to be smarter because the, the same user should come back using cookie or another technique to come back to the same node over and over again. Otherwise, you get some trouble synchronize, synchronizing the, the the state across nodes. So uh, the best. The best, the best practice would be to keep the state on the client. If this is not possible, it's probably to keep the state in a fast database. So the Redis solution could be also an interesting uh, stuff, but the problem does not disappear. So if you would use something like Redis, the question is now um, how to scale Redis, so how many instances, because if you have one instance in memory, you get, um, you get um, uh, the issue that if uh, the instance disappears or the state is lost, the question is, is it crucial or not? It shouldn't be because it's conversational state. If it disappears, nothing should happen. And uh, the most seamless and interesting solution would be to use Infinispan or uh, Hazelgas, for instance. 
this would be um, because what you could do, you can store directly in a hash map and the hash map will replicate all, uh, across all instances. Cool. So what's here? Uh, why have you removed private from entity manager declaration? For easier tests, because if you remove private and unit test is the same package as the entity manager, I could skip you know Archelia and everything else and just instantiate the entity manager directly. I think there are multiple blog posts about that and um, also some some videos. It is past time to come back next year. Yes, Brett. So see you next year. It would be nice. Now. Uh, I, I'm Java and Java advocate. I'm uh, actually I'm not sure whether I'm that advocate or evangelist. I'm more you know I'm just talking what I'm doing and what I'm doing is Java and Java E and now JavaScript. So feel about the fact there is no official or at least no unofficial enterprise ready Java solution for the browser anymore. I think Java server faces is still official and the uh, JSF 2.3 they are alive with uh, servlet 4.0 support with HTTP 2 with lots of uh, community contributions, I would say JSF is still great. And uh, I also have to say I'm working with some startups and they really love JSF. Um, so I'm a little bit cautious, like, okay, no, JSF is like not the most popular technology in Java E and they say, okay, in Java ecosystem, and they say, we don't care, it just works. So then we have JSPs. I mean, JSPs are also great. It's like server-side templating, right? So, uh, I mean, there is... Whether I use mustache or, or handlebars or JSP, there are not lots of difference, I would say. Um, so um, I'm not talking about server-side rendered HTML, but our technology which makes it possible to build offline first progressive web apps or even hybrid apps for all major mobile platforms. I think to answer to this is actually the web standards training I, I showed you earlier. So the, this thing here. So I'm, I'm I'm not using any frameworks here. So I'm just using the platform, which happens to be the browser platform. The question is, should we build an alternative Java E based platform in JavaScript, which I think wouldn't fly. So what I did here, I tried to prove the point that you can you just use browser and, and, and build uh, decent apps without any frameworks, which is a very Javaistic way without Java E <laughs> um, to develop apps. And um, I also think about, you know, uh, to um, I'm recording also more stuff, which is free. This is the, um, it's called bonus section. And there are some more features in pipeline. Um, so um, so responsive design, and I plan to do some uh, offline stuff here just to show you what, how far you can go without any frameworks. So I don't think it's necessary to do this. Okay, so. I hope I answered the question. So um, then Amy says, is there any endpoint glassfish out of the box to deploy static files on the doc root folder? I don't think so. What you can do, you can lose, use loader, uh, loader Adam Bean, it's a small project for me. It just uses the REST API to deploy an, um, to, uh, to deploy a application. And what you can have, you can have a war just with a static content and with, uh, it's called, I think, hmm, Glassfish Web. And with Glassfish Web XML, this is the proprietary uh, um, corresponding part to the Web XML. With that, you could say, you know, I'm, there's the, I'm referring to the root folder and try to do this. So this could work, but an, uh, I had no time, you see this was eight hours ago, to check whether there's actually an API to write something to the doc root folder. I don't think so, because you could break Glassfish itself. Okay. Dino. Hi, Adam. So he's talking about microservice. What about pro topics? So pro topics, security, load balancing, high availability, service discovery, and so forth. Um, are th those topics covered by some of your online courses? Uh, so Java microservices online course. And um, if we go further, there's no security, but here starts, you know, dynamic linking user with user defined networks, linking containers with legacy uh, links. I would, say, I would say starting with the here with 58 to 69 is all about configuration, load balancing and discovery. Having said that, uh, whatever I talk at conferences or in my books is actually what I do in projects. And what happens in projects is um, one project this year, they had five microservices. After my visit, they merge everything to one war. 
thin war and then they will split it again to f better microservices. Then was another a microservice project where they reduced the amount of, uh, of, of wars to a view from, I would say, 20 to up around 5. So um, I, I'm, I don't think it is a good best practice to have you know, hundreds of microservices just to introduce you know, discovery or, or, or API gateways. What I what I see is you know they need to 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 have a stable URIs because if one service talks to another service using REST or any connection based technology, uh, you will need the URI and this is uh, solved by uh, by Docker and and OpenShift and actually all these solutions uh, are are capable of of, do, of doing this. And in my current project, we use. Um, OpenShift and it's also solved because an OpenShift at the end of the day uses Kubernetes and Kubernetes exposes the services using the service endpoints and these are stable load balance so you can absolutely use this URIs as stable URIs and uh, you can even have rolling updates behind the scenes so there's actually no issue at all but I get a question all the time so and security is also solved by by stuff like uh, OpenShift uh, Docker plane not Docker Enterprise it does so um, I try to stay away from security uh, load balancing. I covered in YouTube channel. Actually, there are free free sessions. I use Nginx and HR proxy for load balancing. Let's see, YouTube. Oh, very good. Come on. And there should be cloud and serverless. Yeah, and then. No cloud and serverless. Then do we have here microservices? Yeah, microservices playlist. So and and one point of time. So this is communication between wars with WebSockets. We have pushing Java thin wars to the clouds. So um and 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 there should be load balancing. I did it with HI proxy. Yeah. Load balancing Java in microservices, HTTP load balancing with Doc and Nginx. And this is another atom, which is with similar <laughs> terminal <laughs> setup. Okay. Uh, so I covered this. I mean, what, what pro means? Pro means what you would usually use in projects, right? So um, this. So what are the pros and cons using things like Para Micro? Since it was in a full container, yeah, this is actually what also uh, ask myself. So I think, I mean, I would say, what is the advantage of using full container? The advantage is more people using full containers. So if something breaks, you get more answers, and Para Micro or Whitefly Swarm is more optimized solution. Uh, to uh, to our problems, which you probably could have, but you don't have to have them. So I think the difference between your questions and my approaches is I just you know, uh, try to use the simplest possible solution or no, the most popular solution among my clients and see whether it works. And if it's good enough, I just don't try even to optimize that. So this is what I try to do. And it works well and then developers like it. Um, so and Pyra Micro, I see uh, one one uh, benefit of Pyra Micro, uh, like you know, fully packaged jar. What you could do, you could create your own distribution, which already contains some security libraries from your company, certificates, everything inside the jar, and then it's easier to distribute than a Docker container properly, Docker image or something in in this direction. This could be a benefit. And it's also nice, solve the architect uh, of, at Atos, looking forward to become programmer, of course. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think this is the reference, what I told in one Java One session. So I, I, I shown my own old code at Java One. It was from 2001, criticized myself. And there was somewhere, you know, like uh, I had a, a URL java-architect.com. I said, okay, I start as an architect and then and I was promoted to programmer <laughs> over time. Okay. Now, I use JBatch in view projects on JBoss AIP. This is uh, Monsieur Mistre. 
Patches are scheduled on EJB beans using at schedule annotation. But for that reason, I fire batches using REST EJB JBatch. Okay, so what it does, I guess he directly invokes these schedule methods. The problem is that sometimes it should be fire batch on my dev environment when project is deployed, but there is not desirable solution. How to prevent it? What is preferred model to work to prevent fire schedule on dev environment? Um, now, so what you could do, just misuse the class here, you could actually create at A timer, timer service. So, and uh, then a method timeout. And then what you could do here, you could say um, wait a second, timer service. Yeah, timer service. Save entity. What's going on here? Code is broken. Ah, the, the name of the class is resource. This is why it doesn't work. So, okay. So, go somewhere else. So, we have the service. So, and we could inject timer service. Uh, resource timer service service then in it post construct and this could be a singleton which is startup so and what you could do here is this service cre exactly create timer let's say here any timer like uh, i guess you could create single action timer and let's say with any configuration you like. And the point is the timer you have here is here. And uh, the timeout method, the timer will fire. And what you can do, you can actually cancel the timer if it fired and reinitiate it. So what you can do is after it fired, you cancel it or you cancel it first, then do something and then call the method again. So you are full in full control how often the uh, timer fires. And there's this create, I think it's called create calendar timer. And you can even have schedule expression here. Schedule expression as E and just you can just use whatever you already did. So you can say day of month, you know, is this uh, no, usually we say hours every hour, right? Every minute and every two seconds. Do something. like this do something and I pass the expression and now it is initiated so it will always fire and then I can just recreate a new timer by, call by calling in it so I can cancel this one and recreate a new one so then you are in full control whether that timer should fire if not so um I, I implemented something like this not to overtake already existing no, uh, timers. If this no will fire no every second, and this will block for two seconds, you might be in the situations that wouldn't like to have you know uh, timers waiting for each other. And with that, you can say, okay, first now you are done, and then I will create a new one, and then from then in two seconds something should happen. Uh, this could be also a solution to your problem. I hope. So. Hey, say, ask me, is it advisable using NoSQL backend for real-time solutions like payments? If yes, which vendor do you advise? Huh. First, NoSQL is not a solution 
not a real-time solution for payments. Um, the, the question is why relational database is not good enough. So um, the answer could be because my payment is you no know, crazy structure, like you know JSON tree like structure, and uh, it is really hard to, to to write it to tables to fit it to a table, or it changes very frequently, and we cannot migrate the table back and forth. So stability, then you will have to use NoSQL. And for real time solution like payments or so real time solutions, I think is um, what you could use. Seems like Kafka is the, this is not like NoSQL database. It's more like persistent queue. So it will be replacement for GMS persistent queue. If you don't like GMS persistent queues, you could use Kafka's. But if you already have, uh, if you already have, um, for instance, MQ series installed in your enterprise, just go with MQ series, a stable solution, and it works. But if I will have to choose to install MQ series by myself or use Kafka, I will probably go with Kafka. So um, yeah. And uh, real-time solution, I mean, real-time solution, if you are searching for a streaming solution, this is what you could ask. You now you get a stream of payments and you will have processed them in real time. Uh, there are specific streaming servers, um, but this is also Kafka, what you could do because with Kafka you can move back and forth and process the, the events afterwards. Yeah, I hope I answer your question. You have to be more specific, give me some more context. Uh, but short questions are better for the show. <laughs> okay, so what's here? Ah, he was in Munich. Were you at Airhex? So this was interesting. So first, streaming stopped. No, streaming still works. Seems like it works. And so what's here? So do you recommend using Jcash with Hazelcast? Yeah, you can use Jcash with or without Hazelcast because if you just use Hazelcast, I think you get two lines of code which are dependent on Hazelcast and everything else is basically concurrent hash map if you're only interested in the cache. Okay. So, and seems like you have uh, streaming problems, but uh, everything is well working well in here and everything was recorded well i hope and yeah so i would say see you in december thank you for the project to review it was fun so if you like we can keep doing this so uh, just implement your engine and implement your injection test uh, develop it further ping me and i will review it again and package by package so uh, if you also like it do it um, so if you like check out the podcast and see you at Munich Airport. Where was it? Um, here. Uh, next year with standards, this would be more like the enterprise solution to the problem without Java e even, just with pure JavaScript. And uh, if you like, see you in December. So thank you for watching and bye.